I learned this many years ago from Lorraine Sardillo, where uh, she would always tell me it, it's really hard to separate these two because where you have inflammation, there's something going on with your redox reactions and very likely uh, antioxidants are not winning the fight and yeah. vice versa. Welcome to the Feet Science Podcast. I'm Adam Farinholz coming from North Carolina State University, Prestige Department of Poultry Science, the Feed Milling Program. And on behalf of Wise Genetics, I'd like to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Padram Rezaman, who is a professor of dairy nutrition, animal veterinary, and food sciences at the University of Idaho. Padram, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, um, Glad that we have the opportunity to discuss uh, nutrition topics. Absolutely. If you wouldn't mind, uh, give the audience a bit of uh, your background um, and, and how you came to be involved in dairy nutrition and then what it is you're currently working on there at the University of Idaho. Absolutely. So um, I did my graduate studies at the University of Connecticut uh, early 2000 and then went on to my first postdoc training under uh, the late Lorraine Sordillo at the Michigan State College of Veterinary Medicine focused on uh, interaction of physiology and uh, immune system, mostly focusing on innate immunity and mastitis. Then moved on to my second postdoc under uh, Mark McGuire, again, focusing on mammary gland inflammation and oxidative stress. Uh, and then became a faculty in 2008 at the University of Idaho Animal and Veterinary Science at the time. I've uh, been here since 2008. Um, I teach a couple of uh, nutrition-related courses for undergraduate students, and uh, as well as uh, two courses for graduate students. One is uh, nutrient metabolism, and the other one has to do with uh, biostatistics. Um, okay. I have been... For the first 10 years or so as a faculty, I focused on uh, mastitis, retinal binding protein, and also nutrition to maintain sustainable production by using different feed stuff and um, processing methods. Mm -hmm. And it gradually uh, included the young animals in my work. So I've been working on calves last four or five years with a couple of colleagues here, as well as the University of Alberta, including Dr. Konechi and, and Dr. Lorman, focused on early life stressors in dairy calves. At the same time, about five years ago, I started uh, working with another colleague uh, named uh, Dr. Skibble, Amy Skibble. And we have been focusing on the effect of wildfire exposure in livestock. Um, basically, we are uh, forefront of this topic uh, in the country. We have received uh, uh, several fundings from USDA and other uh, federal agencies and regional agencies to focus on this. It's a great uh, issue here. Uh, super important for Western states. As you know, um, there's a large number of animals here on the dairy side. About 40% of milk production happens here on the West side. And we have the largest uh, number of uh, wildfire smoke events and, and acres burned every year. And it's getting worse. So last five years, uh, Amy Skibble and I have spent plenty of time uh, uh, training graduate students, postdoc, undergraduate students uh, in this area as well. So that those two themes of research summarizes my past five years. Ivonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonics focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. Perfect. 
Well, I think it being the Feed Science Podcast, what we should probably talk about the most is some of the feed additives and processes stuff. But the wildfire thing is really interesting. So I'm going to ask you some more about that. <laughs> that that's, uh, that's a whole new one for me. So what is it that you guys have learned about what the impact is of wildfire smoke and, and what, I don't know, if there is even anything you can do to mitigate it other than obviously not having the wildfires? <laughs> Great question. Great question. So as we all know, uh, wildfires have been uh, have becoming more frequent and more severe in terms of how many times a year we have them out in the West and how many acres they burn. Um, numbers are just staggering really, really high. Um, and, and you can see it in other places around the world as well. We had a big one in New Mexico. We had so, last year. We had a big one in New York, and then the same year we had it in, in uh, Quebec area that uh, people witnessed. It, it, it's recent time, it's more than 60,000 wildfire events just in the U.S. alone. And that's, that's, that's a whole lot of lands basically getting burned where you either have to deal with the fire directly or... In, in our case, what we study is dealing with the indirect effect. Smoke travels a lot. You could have a fire in Quebec City and, and two days later, a day and a half later, you saw the impact on New York City. So we have smoke fire events uh, in Southern California and about a day and a half later, a day later, we in, in North Idaho, we see it. Of course, we have local ones, Southern Idaho, Central Idaho as well. So with that in mind, uh, we have learned that uh, some of the impacts that wildfire smoke has uh, on livestock resembles those that uh, others have seen and reported in humans. Uh, there's very limited information when it comes to livestock. I think this is what the uh, makes uh, us a little bit more successful in, in terms of securing external grants is that mm -hmm. this is relatively new for livestock. Uh, and and uh, But we, we do know that there's some negative impact as far as pulmonary function, as far as mortality and morbidity rates in humans and dolphins. Off the coast of California, there was a study some years ago as well. Uh, but generally speaking, when when um uh, beings basically inhale wildfire particulate matter especially we are focused on pm 2.5 those are the uh uh small very small um particles that uh, could travel throughout our body enter the even once we inhale them they could cross the lung tissues and get into blood circulation so there's a whole lot of pulmonary disease and mortality in humans reported over the past 15 years or so, most of them are attributed to inflammation, either uh, inflammation itself or the consequence of, of uncontrolled inflammatory reactions. Uh, we believe that cattle may be more vulnerable because, first of all, they can't run away and find a refuge somewhere. They're out right. there. That's yeah. number one. Number two, the, basically, there is a unique uh, characteristics of, of the pulmonary system when you compare bovine with humans or other uh, animals. So based on those, we believe that, if anything, cattle would be more sensitive and more uh, um, harmed if, if exposed to these. So uh, we started by looking at and naturally occurring events and how they impact production as well as um, health measurements. So a first report we had, uh, one of our graduate students, Ashley Anderson, uh, in 2020 reported that we could see very easily how um, milk yield changed. Basically, what we have was a reduction in milk yield, not only on the day of exposure, but when we tested it statistically, up to seven days post exposure, we had reduction. So basically, 
uh, there might be more. We just tested for seven days. This right. uh, effect could have lasted three weeks or four weeks, but we, we just tested. This was a smaller study when we started, of course, um, that we wanted to uh, dive in deeper and, and look into mechanistic impacts here, basically. Um, there's, a, again, uh, a bunch of studies, more than 10 studies, mostly epidemiological studies that would uh, basically quantify mortality risk uh, from wildfire smoke naturally taking place. Um, there are a large, very large number in humans, over 300 uh, studies that have focused on human health and the effect of wildfire smoke. There's strong positive association between wildfire smoke exposure and mortality in most of these studies. Um, Basically, some of them have been short terms for two or three weeks, and but some of them have gone to above 50 or 60 days post-exposure. Um, so we know that the effect on, uh, on, on pulmonary system and a, a, a systemic response from immune uh, system as well is very likely to resemble what we see from, uh, from um, wildfire exposure. Um, morbidity rate changes uh, as well in, in some other studies we have looked at. Uh, basically, what we found for a three-year uh, exposure uh, in literature was that in Colorado, uh, for every one microgram per cubic meter increase in wildfire uh, particulate matter, there was a 10% increase in the risk of asthma and combined respiratory diseases. So there's some very accurate information detailed when it comes to human, but unfortunately, we uh, don't have that luxury as far as livestock are concerned. We have just started. I'll be happy to share a website that we have established for this okay. uh, uh, that you could share with, with the audience. I think they will find it uh, pretty useful. We, we have basically divided our effort into two sections. One section deals with uh, new findings as far as research goes, and the other uh, basically deals with the extension and outreach activities related to wildfire smoke. We have published a couple of papers so far. The latest one just got accepted two days ago by um, Alex Pace. It will be in Journal of Data Science Communication. We have also publishing extension articles with our colleagues. I should mention that because we have several ongoing projects, we have several teams working on this. One major effort involves uh, Oregon State uh, Extension and Animal Science, as well as Washington State Animal Science and College of Veterinary Medicine. So we have a relatively large uh, group now. We've grown. We last year involved uh, folks from um, South Dakota State Dairy Science as well because we were looking into one of the projects, if I may point that out, um, had to do with the impact of wildfire smoke in utero oh, on calves. That's yeah, that's, that's, that's the latest one. So we are uh, working on, on getting the results uh, summarized to present it at our annual meeting in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida this June. So as far as what we are planning to do this moment, our uh, USDA with Dr. Amy Skibble uh, leading the charge uh, basically involves a mechanistic approach. So what I mean by this is that when you have a wildfire smoke, we often have a combined impact of heat stress because when smoke, fire, and a smoke happens is when you actually have a high temperature. It's usually August, right? August, September, early September. One, this is considered a confounding factor. Often we are questioned whether this is an impact of wildfire smoke on milk production, change in immune 
cells, circulating immune cells, uh, blood metabolites, or is it something that is caused just by the wildfire smoke inhalation, right? So what we are doing right now is to uh, build our own chambers where we could actually control the environment. We could control uh, airflow coming in and leaving the chamber. Uh, and we will install, we are installing sensors, specific sensors for different uh, compositions inside the chambers where we expose uh, animals into experimentally a wildfire smoke that resembles, as far as fuels, we are actually choosing uh, the fuel that you see in wildfires here, mostly pine and pine needles <laughs> would be most of it. Sure. So. We're we're working with the College of Engineering here, and as well as the Fire Lab here at the University of Idaho, and we're just about to uh, basically establish our chambers. We have about I think six or eight chambers that we have building right now uh, to be able to uh, separate the impacts of wildfire smoke from other environmental stressors like uh, heat stress. Uh, naturally occurring cases would not allow that, but we have established, uh, we built a prototype first last year, one unit where we could actually bring in uh, smoke and, and we had ventilation of course in, in there and uh, <clears throat> several sensors to measure various uh, components in there. Yeah, that's, that's incredibly interesting. Um, I, I was curious, and I mean, obviously, based on where you guys are at at the research, still trying to figure out what exactly happens. Is there uh, theories starting to develop about, okay, what could we do about this? Again, not counting we should have less wildfires, but things that would be done as far as maybe feeding or other management to reduce the inflammatory response, reduce the immune response, or, or otherwise... I don't know, change something in the blood chemistry that would make this less of a concern? Is is that maybe where you're headed is to figure out what's happening and then what could be done to mitigate it once we know what's happening? So we have a couple of lines that we are working on to address these great questions you have. Uh, <clears throat> we are testing a particular type of filter. Uh, it's made in Germany and uh, we are going to test that filter. So basically, when you have indoor facility, we could equip our indoor facilities with those particular uh, filter, uh, air filter that would, uh, would basically allow a better quality air to come in in, in, in terms of a uh, confined system. Now, of course, a lot of our animal livestock are not in confined system. Mm -hmm. They're out sure. and about. So that's a different story. Now, as far as nutrition and nutrient management uh, is concerned, uh, obviously uh, we have learned that uh, hydration is extremely important because it provides a, a better environment in terms of uh, uh, pulmonary system, lung and, and airways. Uh, animal must be really hydrated to be able to naturally deal with the issues of this nature. Uh, or any other pulmonary um, pathogens a little bit better naturally. So that's another part that we're uh, basically making suggestion about. The other aspect that we are experimentally going to test is the impact of anti-inflammatory medications. Okay. Uh, our, our focus is uh, on short-term use of anti-inflammatory uh, medications, uh, we have proposals to test the uh, example of non-steroid base and also a steroid base uh, anti-inflammatory medications. We are also um, completely aware that some of them have withholding time. So if you use it, then you have to withhold the, the milk. So uh, we're hoping to have a, a couple of more answers next year, by the end of next year, as far as the medication goes. The third line we are uh, also going to experimentally test is the um, 
redox story. We want to look at animals where we are promoting the antioxidant capacity of our livestock. Okay. Uh, where we believe that obviously oxidative stress and inflammation are hand in hand. Um, I learned this many years ago from Lorraine Sardillo, where uh, she would always tell me it, it's really hard to separate these two because where you have inflammation, there's something going on with your redox reactions and very likely uh, antioxidants are not winning the fight and yeah. vice versa. When, when you have a shortage of antioxidants or you have a lot of oxidation going on, like we naturally have this in early lactation dairy cows. You have a lot of um, high level metabolic reactions going on because the animal is producing a, a whole bunch of milk. So there's a whole lot of uh, potential for oxidative stress. And we also see at the same time that there's a lot of anti-inflammatory markers uh, within the circulation and at the tissue level. So the third line we're working on is to test this hypothesis, whether or not uh, promoting antioxidant capacity of the animal would help them uh, specifically during uh, wildfire seasons. So this is a third line. But one thing for sure we know that is that inhalation of wildfire smoke increases the risk for other respiratory diseases because in general, it seems like the system is, is weakened and um, immune system seems preoccupied so that it cannot launch a proper response when a pathogen actually comes in to the picture. So that's another uh, aspect that we hope to um, look into. There has been some... Uh, um, literature in, in terms of uh, uh, BRD development in cattle uh, in the face of uh, smoke, uh, wood smoke, and basically pathogen that comes in and causes uh, different uh, um, pulmonary related issues. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we know that some of some of uh, our livestock are naturally more susceptible in certain stages of life to pathogens and disease in general. For dairy cows, that would be transition period when they're about to calve into a couple of weeks into calving, post-calving. So there's a lot of potential for um, developing um, pathogenic responses here. And we suspect that if those animals are, are exposed in August, say, or September, early September, they will have a, a lower chance of, of winning the fight. Sure. Yeah. Wow, that's all really interesting. Again, my guest today is Dr. Pedram Rezaman with the University of Idaho. Um, Let's switch gears. Well, I, actually, I think that was a, a pretty good segue actually into um, in our in kind of our last eight, 10 minutes or so here to talk about what you, you were talking about different stages of life and and pathogenic um, exposure and things like that. And I know one of the other things that you're working on is some of the early stressors for calves. And you mentioned working on things like feed additives and even in processing methods that might be going on and how all of those things interrelate, which seems like it eventually very well may play into some of the stuff where you're doing with the wildfire as well. You know, what strategies have been learned there that might come into, okay, we think we have this way to mitigate this issue. How are we going to get that into the nutrition of the animal. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd be interested in learning some about that part of your, your work as well. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. So as I said, about five years ago or so, um, we started a line of research to take a close look into uh, at, uh, early life stressors in, in newborn calves. What we started with was several lines of, uh, of course, several projects. Uh, we had graduate students working on. Uh, for example, one major project uh, that we act, actually a good number of calves on 
uh, was a, a fully controlled study on campus here where we had um, calves coming in day one and basically we had them to go through two ages for weaning and at each age of weaning we had two groups of, of uh, weaning pace one group was a, an abrupt pace where we uh, wean them over a two and a half day period and mm -hmm. one was over a two week period so basically we had young about 46 47 days of age going either gradually or abruptly wean and we also had older calves about uh, 58 57 days uh, that went either gradually or abruptly so this was a very interesting study we again had another project uh, where we tested the impact of uh, immunity transfer of immunity on day one where baby calves are transported more than 250 miles this is not a typical practice out uh, east coast uh, transatlantic or northeast but out in the west we have actually uh, uh, this very commonly practice where calves are raised elsewhere mm. so sometimes these calves get to travel on day one maybe day and a half or sometimes they travel over 200 miles so one of the project we did uh, uh, was to test the impact of uh, cholesterol feeding on on that day and how they responded to the uh, transportation stress so continuation on on those lines uh, what we're uh, conducting research on now is a new uh, gut oriented um, direct microbial fed that was developed by our, by our colleagues at the University of Alberta, Dr. Leila Guan and Dr. Anna Larman, developed the, this uh, uh, microbial. And we are basically, from the first line of studies, we learned that the age may not be as impactful as we had thought, but pace was very, very important. So most of the impact that we saw came from the pace of weaning. If you gradually wean or if you abruptly wean made a big difference in all the health measurements that we took from the animal one thing i have to uh, confess here is that when we started i thought calves and cows immune system probably will respond the same way and that turned out to be absolutely wrong uh, yes baby calves uh, pre-weaned calves uh, seem to have a very different uh, immune system especially innate immunity and innate responses are quite different uh, as compared to adult cows so learning from our first uh, couple of projects we have focused on pace of the weaning and interaction with this uh, direct microbial that we uh, our colleagues uh, have developed in university of alberta animal science so right now we have one project just wrapping up where we have either uh, gradually weaning them or abruptly weaning them and on each group of weaning they have either received the microbial over a seven day period or they have not and so this brand new we are just wrapping the animal phase we don't have a lot of uh, uh, results yet hopefully uh, we can present that uh, in the coming months uh, at adsa or asas uh, meeting overall i believe that uh, this is an extremely important stage of life and what happens within that eight nine ten weeks early on will have a lasting impact there are evidence uh one simple one would be just the average daily gain that mm -hmm. will last for a long time based on uh, what has happened to a calf uh, in pre-weaning and weaning transition to solid feed. So there's a lot of uh, effort in that area. We have focused on transfer of passive immunity. We just finished a project where we 
took sample from about 1,700 Holstein day-old calves and about 1,600 Jersey day-old calves. And we are trying to establish correlation. Of course, this is not a cause and effect, but correlation between health events, any sort of disease, uh, uh, and uh, their rate of transfer of passive immunity. We have used, of course, proxy measures uh, like total protein uh, and, and things of that nature. But we have a smaller sample size where we have actually measured IgGs uh, as a measure of transfer of passive immunity in young, uh, day old, maybe two days old baby calves and see how that relates to later in life uh, health events, diseases. Our focus mostly has been on diarrhea, and that's the number one issue for young calves. Uh, and then number two issue would be pneumonia, which we also are looking into. So those uh, efforts are, are leading to uh, new publications and extension activity as well. So the latest one I can point out to is the development of gut-oriented microbials that we are uh, basically feeding back. Our preliminary findings were that calves that received this supplement early on during the transition to solid feed had a lower shedding of E. coli okay. in fecal okay. matters. So we are hopeful that uh, by feeding such supplements, uh, we could actually create a better uh, gut environment overall, a healthier gut environment overall, which will be then naturally and organically capable of uh, fighting pathogens and issues that will lead to diarrhea. That's really okay. Yeah, that's that's all. That's all really interesting. And and you know, I think about it, of course, a lot from from my perspective. Two things that I I, I took away looking at it from the feed side, right, is one of the things that we do a lot, I mean, I think in general, we know for a lot of our species in feeding them young is is important. But at the same time, when we think about, you know, the most feed we're making, we're making for the older animals. And then you start thinking a lot about trying to make sure you're keeping up because they're consuming so much. And it can be easy to forget about just how important feeding the young ones are. And if you don't do that right, then the older ones don't matter as much or are or, or impacted quite a bit, I guess is a better way to say. And I think it's also incredibly interesting. And it's again, we're seeing this across species as well. The you know, where the science has led with some of these things like the direct fed microbials and where they're coming from. And, and some of them come from sources that, oh, that makes a certain amount of sense. It's a bacillus or something like that. And others of them are off the wall a little bit. And then we get to experience that in the feed side and go, okay, well, that's great. I'm glad that works. I don't know how to put that into the feed. That becomes the, the next the next part of it. So that's all, that's all really, 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 really interesting. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. I just wanted to emphasize on the same point, on the same line you were pointing out, the first week of life is extremely yeah. important. Immune system is very likely underdeveloped in all the species. This is a very vulnerable period where all sorts of things could happen. So paying more attention to that first few weeks of life in livestock uh, generally yeah. uh, would, would, would pay off later on in life. That's, that's something that we completely uh, believe uh, will happen. I, I'm very much appreciative of the opportunity to share our recent uh, work and be happy to address any question that the audience might have at some point. That was a really great conversation. And once again, I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr. Pedram Rezamon, Professor of Dairy Nutrition, Animal Veterinary and Food Sciences at the University of Idaho. Once again, I'm Adam Farenholz coming to you from North Carolina State University in the Feed Milling Program. On behalf of Wise Genetics, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.